mercy and your grace. Father, we do continue to pray for Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. We pray for the families, faculty. Pray for those that lost loved ones. Father, be with all our schools in America. Father, we thank you for the wonderful people of Guff County. Thank you for this great nation that we live in. Pray for all our leaders in this country. Pray for our leaders in this in this community. Continue to, to lead and guide us. Be with this board this morning as we conduct the people of Guff County's business. Be with our families. Protect our law enforcement, our first responders, Lord. Keep them from any hurt, harm, and danger. Be with our military, Lord. Lord, we pray that we continue to work together as a as a group, as a family, as a as a community. We give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning to everyone. We're I'd like to take this time to welcome everyone to the uh, February 27, 2018 Board of County Commission meeting. Um, at the uh, at the end of the meeting, uh, we have a time set aside for anyone who wants to come before the board. If there's anything you want to bring before the board, um, you will have that opportunity. I ask that you please fill out the form located behind uh, Mr. Paul and uh, Mr. Whitfield right over there. Uh, and please remember that the uh, Guff County does have a, a public speaking ordinance. Um, you allow three minutes for an individual and five minutes if you're representing a group or, or a business. Um, if, and also remember, just want to remind everybody, if anybody comes before the board, please remember to, uh, when you come up to the podium, please state your name, address, and who you represent, please. We want to make sure we get that took care of um, for the record. Uh, first item of business this morning is going to be the consent agenda. Uh, this is where one vote uh, covers a multiple, multiple items um, in the consent agenda. Um, is there anyone in the uh, audience who has any uh, any questions or concerns with the consent agenda? Anyone in the audience? Is there anyone uh, on the staff that have has any questions or concerns with the consent agenda? Chair, recognize Mr. Hammond. Mr. Chairman, if we could pull page 19 and then we can address it directly after or or later in the meeting. We're going to pull page 19. You want to go ahead on and take care of it now? Uh, the reason we're pulling it, it's not a change to the amount of the grant. The grant's $400,000 for the Stone Mill Creek Fire Department. The way it was written when we originally got the grant uh, through Senator Grimsley's office, we had no match other than the land, which was donated to the county. The way that they sent it from the state down, uh, it would not allow for the cost of engineering design and uh, permitting. Uh, they've changed the wording, and we've got a new sheet to, to submit for that. Uh, it's about a $39,000 change. But the, the total of the grant does not change, but we do need to change the wording on that one sheet. Okay. So we're going to pull it. Go ahead and do it. Okay. I need a motion. So move. Got a motion. Second. Motion by Commissioner McCrone, second by <laughs> Commissioner McDaniel. Any other uh, further board discussion? Repeat that, Mr. Pool 19, and to uh, replace that with the attorney's review with the new page. No change to the grant amendment to the to the ground amount, just an amendment to the to the way that we're paying for the engineering inspection and uh, permitting. So I got a motion by Mr. McCrone, second by uh, Commissioner McDaniel. Uh, any any further board discussion? Anyone in the audience on this? No opposition. Motion passes 5 and 0. All right, so now I need a motion to uh, accept the consent agenda with those with those changes. Got a mo motion by Commissioner Rogers. Second, sir. Got a second by Commissioner Rich. Um, 
Any other board discussion? Anyone in the audience on the consent agenda? If not, motion passes. Five and zero. All right, at this time, we're going to go ahead on and move into county staff business. Mr. Butler, you up first. Mr. Chairman, I have a couple of items at this time. Um, got word yesterday from Waste Pro, uh, Waste Providers. Uh, Amnesty Day is going to be on last Saturday. will be the last Saturday in April. It will be on the bills as they come out and also will be advertised in the paper. And the plan is for, from this point forward, to be every last Saturday in April for next year and the following years. So, Amnesty Day, last Saturday in April. Um, be an ad uh, in the paper. Also, it'll be on, on the bill. I uh, have a couple of MRD invoices uh, to do with beach nourishment. And both of these are, are very similar, but they're two different projects. One is due with the 5.2 mile project that we originally designed on the Cape. <clears throat> uh, the reason this invoice come in late because we had to get approval of, by DEP because they, they got a cost share of about 35% of the cost of this and they didn't turn it loose until uh, a couple weeks ago. So the first invoice for the work to be done is $47,537. Uh, so we have a county share of about 33,000, state share of 13,000. So 47,537. And the second invoice dated February 20th is for the rebid and the, and the modification to the specifications. And the total is 16,400, county share of five, of, of 10,579, 64, and the state share of 5,820, 36. Recommend to pay both of these. We uh, we did not put them in the consent agenda because we had questions. We did meet with MRD last week in the office, and we got clear on those. Mr. Yeager and I did. So I recommend to pay both invoices. Yes, sir. So can I get a motion? Um, so moved, Mr. Chairman. All right, I got a motion by Mr. McCrone. Second, Mr. Chairman. Second by Commissioner McDaniel. Any further board discussion on the, with these paying these invoices? Anyone in the public? Come on up to come on up to the podium, sir. Make sure you state your name and James Rich, we were Hitchcock. Yes, sir. I've been waiting for this for a long time. Where's the amnesty day gonna be at? The dumper's gonna be at the courthouse where you bring stuff. Hold on, Mr. Rich. Hold on. We we, we right now we're discussing paying these invoices. Let, let us carry this motion on the invoices. Of course. And then we'll let you speak on I just want to ask Amnesty Day. We don't give I I'll, I'll let you speak on Amnesty Day. Hold on one second. Let's let's carry this motion on with the uh Paying these invoices first. Right, so we got a motion by Commissioner McCrone, second by Commissioner McDaniel. Um, any other, any further board discussion? Anybody in the in the audience on paying these invoices? All right, motion passes five and zero. All right, Mr. Rich, you. I go just ahead. Simply, just I've got stuff waiting to come to this thing. It's once a year. That's all we get. I want to know where it's going to be. It's going to be at the Waste Pro Transfer Station. On the Five Points Road, on the last sure. Saturday in April, and it'd be an ad on your next bill, and also it'd be in the newspaper. Okay, not everybody takes a newspaper, but thank you. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Butler. That's all I have this time. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Novak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, I have a couple items right off the bat and then some other on the agenda later on. Um, the first uh, was brought to our attention that the economic development agreement with St. Joe Company for the mill site improvements, as you all recall, towards the end of last year, you had approved uh, the, um, under your economic development agreement you signed last summer, that gave, that umbrella agreement gave you the ability to move forward and do some site improvements with St. Joe for economic development and job growth. Um, as that agreement begin is sunsetting this month, in addition to that, there's the additional linear feet, 1,000 linear feet that we've talked with the commissioners about that go under the actual bridge. Um, as we go to extend that current agreement with St. Joe Company, they're sharing the costs with you and the county. Um, right now, that additional 1,000 linear feet, uh, the proposal is for $59,750, as well as the uh, 
additional permitting and oversight of $6,900 with Dewberry. Um, so we'd like your authorization through a vote to extend the agreement with St. Joe to complete that additional 1,000 feet under the bridge um, that they're sharing in the costs and give us the ability to continue to operate under your economic development right now. Yes, sir. We get a so move. motion by Commissioner Rogers. Second. Second by Commissioner McCrone. Any, uh, any further board discussion on this issue? Anyone in the public? Anyone in the public? Any opposition to the motion? Motion passes 5 0. Mr. Chairman, thank you. The only other item, um, as, we've, as the staff has discussed with each of you individually, is the economic development agreement for the uh, improvements under the JPA to the mill site. Um, what, right now, we have the proposed language introduced to both the St. Joe Company and Eastern Shipbuilding. Mr. Harrison's here today. Um, I'm sure he'll speak to some of it. What we'd like to ask for today is subject to final attorney review of all three parties. Um, and working with the attorneys for both Eastern and St. Joe Company and myself is an authorizing vote for the chairman to sign. The economic development agreement that we've discussed previously over the last three months would give all three parties the ability to go on and begin spending this JPA money on that site. And as you all know, the state appropriated $6 million um, of that money to give us the ability to give Eastern and the county uh, easement grants to get on the property and start doing these site improvements in advance of this floating dry dock. Um, what I'd like to ask for is authorizing vote for the chairman to sign following Mr. Butler and my final review once we receive signed copies back from both the St. Joe Company as well as the Eastern Shipbuilding. Yes, sir. Thank you. Can I get a motion? Motion, Mr. Chairman. Motion by Commissioner McCrone. Second. Second by Commissioner Rogers. Any further board discussion? Anyone in the public on this issue? Anyone in the public? Any opposition to the motion? Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have this time. Yes, sir. Mr. Hammond? Just two quick announcements. Uh, <clears throat> on March the 15th at noon, uh, in the courtyard between the, the jail and the, and the courthouse, we're having a retirement party for Mary Allen, uh, who's been a county employee for more than 33 years and uh, will be retiring at the end of next month. And then on March 22nd, the next week at 5 o'clock at Veterans Park uh, at Beacon Hill, we're having Mr. Butler's retirement party. We'd like to invite the public and all the staff and former employees to come and, and share with the, those two individuals as, as, uh, as they prepare to retire at the end of next month. That's all I got. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Been a long road, Mr. Butler. Yes, sir. Ms. Carey, you got anything? Mr. Yeager, back there somewhere high. Oh, Mr. Yeager? No? Okay. Warren Bowe. He must be outside. <laughs> Mark? Got one thing, Mr. Chairman. Uh, been working in conjunction with uh, Mr. Rogers on the Donnerbrake Park walking trail about getting it paved. Got a quote in from proposal from Jason White, and so what I want to do is get a motion for uh, to make it payable from the road bond for Mr. Rogers Park. Fourteen thousand eight hundred dollars. You know, I can't hear in the back, Mark. Yeah. Uh, repeat that, Mark. It's the walking trail for the uh, Donny Brake Park. Hold on one second. I don't think that mic on. It's working. Yeah, it's working. All right, go ahead. Okay, the walking trail for Donny Brake Park. I've been working with uh, Commissioner Rogers on the linear feet. It's about a little over 2,000 linear feet. We have a proposal from Jason White for $14,800. We'd like to make it payable from the road bond. Okay. Need a motion? Yes. I'll make yeah. Motion. We got a motion by yes, Com uh, Commissioner McDaniel. Second. Second by Commissioner Rich. Any further board discussion on PANS? I, I would pans? just like to say I, I appreciate what they've done working on that. First quote we got was way high for what we needed to do. Uh, Mark went out and got with the contractors, and we got it where we can afford it. It's going to be something we don't have to maintain anymore, like paving a road, kind of. Something will be there and everybody can enjoy. I sure appreciate y'all. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any further board discussion? 
anyone in the public on on this issue? Any opposition to the motion? Motion passes five and zero. Oh. All right, Mr. Mr. Lee, I didn't forget you over there. You just in a new spot. Now. Yeah. <laughs> Got anything? Oh, I don't have nothing this time, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. All right. Mr. Paul? No, sir. Mr. Whitfield? Not at this time. Ms. Kelly? Mr. Leanna? No, sir. All right. Sheriff? Sir, I'm good. We're missing. Nobody? Okay. All right. We'll move on to board business then. I'm good, Mr. Chairman. Rogers? I'm good, thank you. Wrong. Nothing, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rich? Morning. <laughs> I'm sorry, I go right ahead. It's gonna be like it's gonna be a pretty good day then. <laughs> and I have any I don't have anything for the board this morning. All right, we'll move on down to uh um I'm gonna move make a little change here. No, it's not a change. I want to bring up uh, Mr. William, Mr. William Harrison, and um, we'll come before the board in reference to Eastern Shipbuilding. Good morning. Good morning. morning. <clears throat> My name is uh, William Harrison, 101 Harrison Avenue in Panama City. I'm going to try to get a uh, presentation up on the screen for you. Uh, while he is setting that up, um, greetings from uh, from Brian Desernia, uh the CEO of, of Eastern Shipbuilding, and one of his sons, uh, Joey, who is the president of the company. They have a meeting this morning uh, with the Coast Guard at their office uh, in Panama City. About 150 people are in that meeting at this hour, and uh, that's why they can't be here today. <clears throat> I'm going to cover a lot of material uh, this morning. Hopefully, um, I'm going to address uh, questions and and uh, concerns uh, that uh, that you have uh, concerning our unsolicited proposal. Answer questions that uh, uh, probably are in the minds of the public. Uh, I'm going to do my best to uh, cover material in a in a concise manner. Uh, hopefully I am going to cover what is of concern and interest to you and be happy to take your questions either along the way or at the end. I believe um, he's going to control the, um, <clears throat> the slideshow for us when he, okay. Well, you keep working on that and holler at me when you're ready. Uh, Eastern Shipbuilding started uh, back in the late 70s in Panama City. We have two yards uh, in Panama City, one at the Nelson Street Yard, which is downtown, one at Allenton, which is uh, on East Bay, uh, close to the, uh, the, uh, the cut from East Bay into the Intercoastal. Uh, this will be uh, what we're proposing uh, to the commission. I'm ready whenever you are. Okay. Uh, what we're pro proposing to the commission is the establishment of a new yard here in Port St. Joe. Uh, this is a project that's been going on for a long time. As each of you are aware, uh, we have been working on this for, for five or six years uh, here locally uh, with the commission all the way to, uh, to Congress and everybody in between. Uh, it has been a, a long, sometimes torturous uh, process that uh, culminates with uh, the proposal that we made to the commission several months ago uh, for the the uh, the new vision and the new use of the uh, the old mill site that property has been uh, under lease by the St. Joe company or from the St. Joe company for about five years now we were hoping everything would work out with the Coast Guard uh, we've been in a in a national competition with seven six other yards uh, they were down listed to three Ultimately, we were selected uh, where we uh, were given the opportunity to, uh, to do final design, the detailed design of a new Coast Guard cutter. 
uh, that will be constructed in Panama City uh, and still will be cut on that uh, first vessel starting in August and September of this year. So it brings about big changes and big opportunities uh, for the company. Uh, as you can see here, the, uh, the types of vessels that we have constructed uh, since 1977 are, are uh, quite a, a great variety of vessels. About 350 have been uh, manufactured and launched at the two yards in Panama City. And, and uh, if, if you gentlemen have not uh, been to one of our launches, uh, we would certainly welcome you there and, and be happy to show you our facilities at Allenton and at Nelson. Uh, all of these uh, vessels can be seen in detail at our website. I would in encourage you to go look at uh, easternshipbuilding.com. Welcome the public to go look there as well, and you can see uh, a lot of the projects <coughs> excuse me, that we're, we're proud of. As I mentioned a minute ago, um, we went after uh, the biggest, most long-standing uh, defense contractors in the history of the United States. Uh, we have fought against those who build vessels that uh, protect us not only on our, our borders but also around the world uh, with uh, any number of different vessels, you know, whether it's, um, you know, fighting vessels, uh, submarines, you know, dealing with uh, every type of, of war, floating war machine that the federal government has come up with. Uh, those were the, the types of competitors that we had in this process. So it was um, a breath of fresh air for the Coast Guard to look at um, a yard in Panama City, Florida uh, that was unknown uh, to the Coast Guard. We have just done commercial work uh, up to this point, and this will be our first uh, construction project uh, for the federal government. Some of our greatest. Uh, <clears throat> Hold on one second, Mr. Harris. Motion, Mr. Chairman. Got a motion by uh, Commissioner McCrone to extend second. the time. Second by Commissioner Roger. Thank you, gentlemen. Go ahead. Um, our biggest uh, uh, competitors, and, and I would suggest to this community now, your biggest competitors are uh, companies that are located in Mississippi, Louisiana, and in Maine. Uh, I hope as a commission and as a community you'll get to know what our competition is because we will be joining together uh, to, to make sure that, that what we do here is uh, continually uh, competitive uh, against some of these big yards uh, across the, com the country. Uh, Bollinger Schwest and General Dynamics are two of our largest competitors in Mi Mississippi, Louisiana, and Maine. Uh, it is significant to note that <clears throat> With the history between these yards and the federal government, uh, there is a constant flow of work. Uh, in order to maintain the, the workforce, the supply lines, uh, the, the know-how to build the types of vessels that are needed uh, for the protection of the people of the United States. Our contract uh, is actually through the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, that's where the Coast Guard is based because it is um, uh, a homeland uh, a protection agency uh, rather than a, a defense force or an offensive force. Uh, so what we're going to be building, uh, the vessel that you see here, an award that uh, was given uh, to us in September uh, of 2016, is a state-of-the-art vessel. Uh, there's, there are currently 33 vessels uh, that, that this fleet will be replacing. And the, uh, the, the, the program of record for this vessel is for uh, 25 vessels to replace the 33 that are currently on the water. Some of those are up to 50 years old. We hope if all goes well, uh, the, the purchase by uh, the Coast Guard will be above the 25 that's uh, currently uh, in their, their, uh, uh, their program of record. This tells you a little bit about uh, what this contract is about. Uh, it is a $10.5 billion contract. All of that does not come to Eastern. It is for everything that is a uh, financial obligation of the federal government in paying for the, the design and, and construction, uh, all of the inspection and everything related to uh, equipment purchasing and so forth uh, for these 25 vessels. 
we're under contract to build the first nine vessels. Uh, the Coast Guard has the ability to recompete after the ninth vessel. All of the information that we have for pricing, design, lessons learned, and so forth uh, will be available to uh, our competitors, the competitors of all of us, uh, if the, the federal government decides to recompete after the ninth vessel. We hope that we can do such a good job in all the different aspects of this contract that the Coast Guard will choose not to rebid this contract and we can get the full program of record of 25 cutters that are uh, under this contract. I'm going to look quickly, uh, just so you know, I, I won't look at this in detail out of the interest of time, uh, but you can see here, uh, hopefully the font is large enough for you to see these numbers, uh, the amount of money that is spent in the states uh, of our competitors, uh, where the legislative bodies uh, in Maine, Mississippi, and Louisiana uh, put tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars uh, towards the shipbuilding infrastructure in those states in order to uh, support not only the shipbuilders, but all of the ancillary businesses, the vendors, uh, material men, and suppliers that uh, are part of the construction of vessels in those states. So you can see that with Maine. Here's Mississippi. Uh, you know, one of our, probably our closest competitor. Uh, it, it's worth noting, I guess, that uh, there are no other shipyards uh, in the state of Florida that uh, competed for this. Uh, although there are a couple of other shipyards, uh, we're the only ones in the state of Florida that went after this contract. So here's more information uh, concerning Mississippi. Here's Louisiana. Uh, and you can look at the amounts of money uh, that is provided uh, in competition for the contract that, that we're going to be performing uh, for the Coast Guard here. Uh, the state of Alabama, uh, as you know, uh, works uh, very hard in economic development and providing uh, various types of, of uh, incentives, uh, support, um, tax breaks, and so forth for all different types of manufacturing. And so there are some examples uh, that you see here with, with Airbus, Mercedes, and so forth. And so they are a, a potent uh, competitor of ours uh, as we go through uh, in, in developing this, this contract and hopefully expanding it. As uh, Mr. Novak mentioned to you earlier, uh, there was uh, there is a, a joint participation agreement uh, that the Commission is familiar with. This is from last year's legislative appropriation of six million dollars. Five of that goes to the floating dry dock infrastructure. A million of that goes to dredging. Uh, the, this commission uh, approved the, the joint participation agreement and uh, we have uh, been working uh, under that JPA now for uh, I guess about a month and you will begin to see as permits and issues, uh, permits are issued, uh, you will see work on the site that uh, is underlying uh, all of these slides that you can see is the, the acreage that we lease from the St. Joe Company. We have 20 acres under a long-term lease with an option to increase the lease by another 20 acres. And this is the, the site plan, uh, preliminary site plan that, that will show you uh, what that property will look like uh, generally with the access to the floating dry dock. Uh, that location may change depending upon uh, permitting. Uh, we did the the soil analysis, soil borings uh, week before last, and we're waiting on results for that. So uh, there will be uh, dredging along the bulkhead, and the floating dry dock needs to sink to about uh, 40 feet, uh, which is a, a huge uh, steel dock uh, that will that will sink to the bottom. The vessels will come onto the the floating dry dock. All the water is pumped out in the vessel, and the dock is, is lifted up. Uh, you can see, uh, this is a picture that I took in Tampa. Uh, I, I don't know the specifications of this particular dry dock, but in case anyone is unfamiliar with what a dry dock looks like, that's generally uh, what this will look like. I don't know the size of this particular Coast Guard vessel, but I happened to be driving uh, in Tampa uh, this past summer and, and saw that right off the highway downtown and looped around and took a picture of it right beside it uh, just to the, the north of this is another floating dry dock uh, with a little bit larger Coast Guard vessel on it. So that's what we have in mind uh, to do on the property. And as you can see here, uh, 
these are details that uh, you probably can't see from the distance, uh, you know, where you are. But the length of this is about 425 feet with a, a width of about 120 feet uh, that will allow us to pull the, uh, the vessels uh, up on a dry dock. Under our contract with the Coast Guard, we are required to pull these vessels uh, out of the water if they have not been delivered to the Coast Guard within 365 days of when they're dropped in the water uh, by launch. Uh, and so our, our goal is to, uh, to have Port St. Joe as the haul-out location uh, for, the, uh, for the Coast Guard uh, uh, OPC. Uh, if that is something that is required, the, the dry dock is also going to allow us uh, to do vessel repair, uh, which I'll get into here in just a minute. Here are some of the benefits uh, for this community for uh, the, the shipbuilding and repair uh, work that we're looking at doing here in Port St. Joe. This is based on a U.S. Maritime Administration study uh, for the direct and indirect uh, uh, economic impacts of, of shipbuilding and ship repair. Uh, this is a report that the MARAD does uh, every couple of years uh, to look at what is the, the indirect effect of the creation of jobs uh, in a community where there is shipbuilding and repair. You can see from this slide the number of jobs that are created across the country uh, and, and those that are direct jobs and those that are indirect jobs. The darkest uh, color blue uh, are direct jobs uh, that are uh, those who actually are working in shipyards <laughs> for uh, manufacturing and repair. Uh, the lighter color, um, whatever that color is, kind of a greenish color, uh, as you can see the, the indirect jobs uh, are greater than the direct jobs that are actually uh, in shipyards. So I would encourage you if you, if you want to look at economic impact uh, to look at the merit excuse me, the Marriott study under the U.S. Maritime Administration, uh, you can see a number of those different reports, uh, which is where I'm getting this information. Uh, this particular slide talks about uh, where is it that you can affect the, uh, expect the impact of jobs that are created uh, in the repair business, the haul-out business, and so forth that we uh, propose here at the, the old mill site. You can see that most of the, the, the jobs are uh, from the service industry. Uh, we have a lot of vendors in Panama City uh, and around the region that we use, uh, not only for manufacturing but for outfitting. Uh, there will be some outfitting uh, that we'll be doing here in Port St. Joe with some commercial vessels uh, that I'll show you here in just a minute. Uh, and, and what that means is there's daily activity of our vendors uh, and suppliers who are providing all different kinds of things as we uh, manufacture and outfit all these vessels. Uh, we're essentially going from a steel hull uh, with engines, uh, you know, that uh, when the vessel uh, shows up here, commercial vessel comes here to Port St. Joe, it will be a, a steel hull and, and motors and whatever is necessary in order to get the vessel here. And then everything else uh, will be done here in Port St. Joe uh, on some vessels that I'm going to show you here in just a minute. And so the the vendors, the suppliers, material men, subcontractors, uh, all different kinds of things are daily activities uh, that uh, we cannot require our vendors uh, to be located here in Port St. Joe. Uh, but with the, the amount of work and the type of work and the length of, of the contract that we have, uh, you know, you can reach your own uh, conclusions about whether uh, these vendors and suppliers are going to continue to want to drive from Panama City over here uh, or whether they're going to locate uh, here in Port St. Joe. We can't require them to come here, uh, but for convenience purposes, uh, we believe that, uh, that we'll see uh, that type of activity. This is some more detail concerning uh, dry dock uh, capabilities uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so what, if we don't build the dry dock, you know, what happens? If we don't have a dry dock in Port St. Joe, then what happens with this contract? Under the, the requirements of, of boat manufacturing, and you have seen this, uh, I, I'm sure, uh, around here, we have a lot of this in Bay County, where there are sea trials, vessels, it's kind of like taking a car for a drive, you know, when you go to the dealership, uh, you're not going to just, you know, take it off the lot and, and go stick it in your garage. Uh, there are a lot of sea trials and a lot of things that, uh, that test the capability of the vessels. 
and uh, in, in their issues, uh, whether it be during launch, whether it is the amount of time that a vessel is in the water, maybe that maybe there is some issue up underneath with the with uh, through hull uh, uh, components uh, where the vessel needs to be removed uh, from the water. If we don't remove it uh, in uh, in Port St. Joe on the dry dock here, then we will have to carry the vessel uh, by tug to uh, other uh, dry docks that are in the in the region. The closest being Mobile and Tampa. The problem with those, as you can see in the, in the picture I showed you a minute ago, you have to wait in line to, uh, to get your, your slot to go in there and, and get the work done. There are liquidated damages provisions uh, in our contract, so if uh, the delays are too long, then we end up being financially penalized. So it is better for us uh, to be able to control our own destiny, if you will, in being able to pull the vessels out of the water when we need to pull them out of the water. What it is also going to allow us to do is to get into the ship repair business, uh, which will uh, be something that is not provided in the northern Gulf Coast. And uh, we hope to do uh, ship repair, which we have, uh, we have great opportunities in doing that uh, here um, based on the limited uh, facilities that are available in the southeast. Uh, we have great opportunities here uh, to do that uh, in, in Port St. Joe. Uh, I would encourage you to go look at the Grand Bahama Shipyard. Uh, if you look under that uh, name uh, on, the internet, on the internet, you can see uh, that is a floating dry dock uh, facility that is in, uh, in the Grand Bahama Islands. Uh, the amount of work that they do on, their, on commercial vessels, many of which are ones that have been manufactured at Eastern Shipbuilding, uh, because they cannot get uh, time on a floating dry dock in, uh, in Florida, Alabama, or Louisiana. They end up going to the Bahamas uh, to be pulled out for various types of maintenance and painting and, and different kinds of things. So if you go on the, the uh, Grand Bahama uh, Shipyard website, you'll see a number of the, the eastern uh, vessels that are there for uh, maintenance and different types of work. So we hope to, to uh, uh, provide all of that work here. Uh, many of you, like me, uh, when you take your car in for uh, service and maintenance or repair, uh, you go back uh, to the dealership, and uh, that's what we're hoping to be able to do here with with facilities in Port St. Joe. Now, an exciting thing for uh, for this uh, project in in uh, the yard that that we uh, hope to also set up as a as an outfitting yard uh, with the six million dollars that we have from the legislature. As I said, a million of that goes to dredging, five million of that goes to uh, related improvements. It will give us uh, everything that we need to set this yard up as an outfitting yard. Uh, this is the first vessel that is currently under construction at our Allenton yard. Uh, we have a contract with the city of New York to build three of these ferries. Uh, they're a little bit over 300 feet long. And uh, this vessel that you see here, this is a conceptual uh, rendering. Uh, all of these vessels, these three vessels, will be outfitted uh, at our facility here in Port St. Joe. Uh, at the, the timeline that we have provided uh, to your staff uh, uh, projects uh, a schedule of uh, middle of next year when the first ferry will show up uh, at the dock here in Port St. Joe and all the outfitting uh, for this vessel will be done uh, here in Port St. Joe. As soon as the first vessel is launched, uh, we will uh, be assembling the component pieces of vessel number two. Uh, that will be launched and it will be brought over here. If you look at the configuration that I so showed you earlier on the site design, uh, we have about a thousand feet of bulkhead uh, on the property that we lease from the St. Joe Company, and uh, we expect that we may have as many as two of these uh, tied up to the bulkhead at one time um, uh, under outfitting. Uh, each of those will take about a year, year and a half to outfit, and all that will be done here. These are the types of vendors and suppliers, uh, a long list of things, uh, some of which currently exist in, in Port St. Joe and Gulf County. Some of them do not. Uh, and hopefully that, uh, as I said a minute ago, that uh, our vendors that we use on a daily basis will find it more convenient to work out of their facilities here in Gulf County rather than uh, traveling from Panama City. Our total expenditures in the 2016-17 uh, fiscal year 
uh, was ten and a half million dollars uh, with uh, various vendors that we have in uh, in Bay County. Uh, the expenditure per vendor uh, on average was about sixty-seven thousand dollars. So you can see that uh, just with the commercial work that we have in the different uh, tugboats and and uh, ferries and dredge uh, vessels that we uh, built uh, during that 12-month period, uh, that there was a ten and a half million dollars. It went to our vendors in uh, Panama City and Bay County. Um, concerning the the floating dry dock, uh, I mentioned to you earlier the the closest location are Tampa and Mobile. Uh, the proposal that we have given to uh, to your staff and and uh, it is in the package that that you've had for a couple of months is our proposal that uh, Eastern Shipbuilding would uh, would use a design that is created by this board. Uh, there was a contract, uh, I, I don't know whether or not it has been executed or not, but uh, the board took action uh, hiring a design firm uh, a meeting or two ago uh, for the design of a floating dry dock. Uh, and our proposal is that we would take that design and construct that. Uh, most of the construction will be done at the Allenton Yard uh, in East Bay. Uh, the component parts will be uh, brought over to Port St. Joe uh, to, to be assembled on this property and to be launched here. It will be uh, probably about a six or eight, eight month uh, period of, of work uh, after we uh, uh, construct the, uh, the component parts. Now, if, if you're looking at time frames, and, and I'll get to that uh, in detail in a minute, uh, we've got probably four or five months worth of design on the floating dry dock, and we've got about 18 months of construction uh, before you actually will see component parts here on the property in Port St. Joe. And then that will be uh, launched and affixed uh, to the bulkhead uh, there on the property at the old mill site. This is a, a, a timeline uh, that we have under contract with the with the Coast Guard, a lot of detail there that is basically uh, as we drop each vessel in the water uh, when it is that when we have delivery date. The reason why that's important to you is, is that is when uh, we're going to be under obligation to pull those vessels out of the water if we get 365 days after the date of launch and all that will have to be done uh, on the dry dock. So the schedule that we're dealing with, with design and construction and the actual uh, launch of the dry dock, uh, we are dealing with this time frame here that we're under contract uh, with the Coast Guard to produce. Uh, let's see if I have... Some of the challenges that we have uh, coming into Gulf County, uh, many of you know that uh, there was a contract uh, a number of years ago that we had with a Brazilian company uh, to uh, to produce uh, five uh, oil supply vessels. Uh, our, our hope and our goal was to uh, establish and to gather a workforce in Gulf County and in Port St. Joe to be able to help us with that contract. We, we uh, sent an employee over here, Lisa Barnes, uh, spent a good bit of time in Port St. Joe looking for uh, every different type of, uh, of, of welder, materialman, uh, pipe fitter, uh, carpenters, electricians, all the different things that we need. Uh, we were disappointed, and, and it's really, you know, not a surprise. Uh, the workforce that was here, you know, when the mill was was going and blowing, uh, those folks have had to go somewhere else. And unfortunately, there were not uh, many people that we could hire uh, that were useful to us in the manufacture of those vessels. That has been instructive to us as we look at developing a workforce here in, in Gulf County for this project. Uh, we believe that it will be difficult to find the number of people that we need uh, to, to fill all the positions uh, of, of, of a skilled workforce for the work uh, at this facility. So it's going to take us some time not only to develop uh, the workforce, but also to, to get the infrastructure on the ground. And that's why we're proposing uh, to build most of this uh, in Panama City. We've got about $75 million worth of improvements in buildings and cranes and plasma cutters and really 
high te highly technical uh, equipment for manufacturing, uh, which doesn't exist here. Uh, it doesn't exist, you know, uh, el elsewhere uh, in uh, the, the Gulf Coast of Florida uh, besides possibly in Tampa. Uh, and so we're going to construct uh, a lot of things on the floating dry dock in Panama City to bring over here. And, and what we're hoping to do is to prime the pump and get things going here for infrastructure and, and for the workforce. But both of those are necessary for us to be successful. Uh, you recognize the challenge that we have. We've got to be able to perform on the contracts that we have. Uh, it is a risk uh, to Eastern to come here uh, with contracts with really hefty uh, liquidated damage clauses, whether it is the Coast Guard or the, uh, the Staten Island Ferries or any other commercial vessel that we construct there, uh, there are hefty liquidated damages uh, if we don't uh, perform on time. So it is a risk to us to come here and say, okay, uh, the, you know, the workforce is going to show up and be here to do all of these uh, 15 or 20 uh, different skills uh, that we need. So as part of that, we have gone to the legislature this year, uh, and, and I would like to say, and, and I could list a lot of folks, and, and, and the, the commission is aware of this and the staff, uh, it has been, there's been a lot of work uh, from the legislative delegation in Bay County and in uh, Gulf County to get these things done. We're dealing with TRIOP. We're dealing with these appropriations from last year uh, for $6 million into Gulf County. Uh, we have a request in uh, that has passed the, the House and the Senate uh, committees for, um, for workforce development in Gulf County. Uh, we have done that in working in, in partnership with uh, the superintendent and the school district in being able to uh, construct a facility and to be able to develop a workforce that we need uh, to be able to perform the work uh, here in Port St. Joe. So hopefully that will pass uh, uh, the, the full uh, legislature and, and will be signed into law by the governor uh, in May or in June. Uh, if that is the case, then we will begin uh, quickly to, to work on development of a workforce uh, here in Port St. Joe and in Gulf County. When you look at the impact of this one contract uh, with the uh, with the OP the, the Coast Guard OPC, uh, it requires a thousand direct jobs, a thousand direct hires uh, for manufacturing of of uh, these vessels, which will result in somewhere between uh, thirty five hundred and and five thousand uh, indirect jobs. If you go back and and uh, and consider. The MARAD study, we have done an economic impact study through the Haas Center out of uh, University of West Florida, and, and, and these are the numbers that they give us as far as the direct and indirect, or excuse me, the indirect jobs. The direct jobs are the kind of things that I don't understand, uh, and, and probably you don't. You know, how many man hours does it take to, to build uh, a vessel uh, for the Coast Guard? Uh, Eastern knows how to do that, and, and it takes, a, you know, a thousand workers. Uh, uh, to be able to, to perform that. So that is the, the economic impact that we see there on that one uh, job. Uh, there will be overflow of that uh, related to the, the Coast Guard contract and as it relates to the uh, uh, commercial contracts that we have. Um, there are details uh, that we have made in, in commitment uh, to you uh, for the proposal that we have. Uh, and we were also uh, making the commitment to the Triumph Board in the application uh, that is pending by this board to the Triumph uh, Gulf Coast uh, Board in their meeting uh, next month. This is a funding summary of uh, what we anticipate to be done with infrastructure improvements in uh, Port St. Joe. You can see the different costs, uh, the source of funds, the JPA is the current uh, $6 million that has been appropriated, it is being held by DOT, and is being um, uh, provided uh, to uh, the property through the county commission uh, for the improvements uh, that you see listed there. Uh, we have a request uh, for a total of $27 million uh, from the Triumph Board, which is what we currently anticipate will be uh, left over after the, uh, the JPA funds are spent uh, on the the uh, infrastructure for the floating dry dock. So the total investment uh, for everything uh, is our, our best estimate based on, on uh, 
having worked on this for quite a long time, uh, is right now at about $34 million. Uh, you can see that uh, the, the current uh, funding from the legislature is not in this because it doesn't go to, to improvements uh, on this property. Uh, but if you wanted to, you could add another $625,000 uh, to that. As far as the employment summary for Gulf County, uh, this is the uh, proposal that we have made to uh, the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, we have adjusted some of the dates based upon meetings that we had uh, with, uh, with DEP last week, uh, where they brought uh, all of their permitting uh, managers uh, from Pensacola to meet with us in Panama City. We had a meeting with your staff uh, yesterday, I guess it was, uh, uh, concerning these permitting dates. And so you can see with the asterisk, uh, they're not really clear on this, but the top three lines, uh, as far as creating the jobs and, and when will you start seeing people on the ground, some of that is subject to permitting from DEP, which we anticipate will move pretty quickly. The Army Corps of Engineers is a little bit more difficult to predict. Uh, and so we're being conservative when we uh, give you the dates here. We think it'll be quicker than this, but um, uh, we've got to get the permits in the hand before we can start making the improvements uh, on the property. Essentially, the infrastructure plan that we have is for uh, the construction of a warehouse uh, building. It, it's basically uh, a metal building where we'll be doing manufacturing and, and work and, and, and tooling and so forth. The platens are, are concrete pads where we uh, assemble uh, various different things. Uh, they, those are basically uh, work areas for us uh, outdoors. Uh, that, that we need uh, utilities for gas and, and oxygen, uh, uh, you know, various uh, types of, of uh, electrical needs uh, for those platens where, uh, where welding will, will take place. Uh, the, the vessel outfitting that you see with the uh, 75 jobs, the FTE is a full-time equivalent, uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with that uh, abbreviation. Uh, the first uh, Staten Island Ferry is, is projected to be here in June of 2019, and then those will continue on um, uh, it, as long as it takes to outfit all of those. Uh, we believe that the dry dock construction uh, will begin in uh, five to six months. It will take about 18 months uh, to complete that, uh, that work uh, at Allenton, and then uh, and then we will be bringing those in, in January of 2020 here uh, for final assembly and launch. Uh, as soon as the dry dock is uh, in place and operational, uh, starting that same month, June of 2020, is when we would add the, uh, the 45 full-time jobs uh, for the repair facility and the operation uh, of the floating dry dock. So the permanent direct uh, full-time jobs would be 120. Uh, under this, uh, under the, the work schedule that we have right now, the indirect, uh, based on the, the MARAD multiplier, is 314 for a total of 434 jobs uh, that we anticipate will be here on this schedule in, uh, in Gulf County and in Port St. Joe. As far as ownership is concerned, uh, as I said at the beginning, the property uh, it consists currently of uh, 40 acres. 20 acres is under a, a long-term lease with the St. Joe Company uh, right along the bulkhead. We have the option to increase uh, uh, as part of that uh, lease uh, the additional 40 acres that is uh, between the, the bulkhead and 98. Uh, the St. Joe Company uh, has been very helpful working with us in, uh, I mean, we've been paying rent uh, let me say that uh, for about five years uh, but they've been cooperative with us in in working uh, with the legislature and with the county commission and your staff in in working out the details for how we can make all this happen uh, as you see here the the long-term lessee is uh, Eastern Shipbuilding Group uh, the owner of the floating dry dock would be the Gulf County Commission and uh, and then we would lease that on a long-term basis uh, to or from the county commission so that all the work that we need to do and, and everything that we project uh, can be done uh, on the floating dry dock. So if you had not heard enough, uh, I'll stop there, see if you have any questions. I'm happy to go into all the detail that you want, and maybe I said more than 
more detail than you wanted, but uh, uh, happy to answer any questions that you have or go into in anything in any more detail. Any board members with questions for Mr. Harrison? Chair, Chair recognizes Mr. Commissioner Thank McDaniel. You, Mr. Chairman, uh, <clears throat> I want to primarily address the audience. I've been a senior commissioner here. I have worked with this project directly and indirectly with Mr. Harrison, Mr. Discernio, and people. This is, uh, at one time, Port St. Joe was a boom town. You know, we had the smokestacks going and the smell, and everybody said, oh, that smell, that's bacon and eggs. Well, we're in a different era now, and you have to change comes all the time. But this is going to be great for Guff County, not only Guff County. We will have to reach out to Franklin County, to Bay County, to Calhoun County, to Liberty County. As Mr. Harrison stated, you've got direct workers. I've talked up. I live up in Weewehitchka, for those who may not know, along with Commissioner uh, Fish over here. We have a lot of people that are out on the road construction. And I ask them, they say, we want to come home. We want to sit down at night at our table. We want to go to church in our community. We want to go watch our children play ball. We want to come home. And this is a golden opportunity to bring some of our people. People will be moving in. And we have bedding areas. The port will be right over here and the rail right over here you can't move it up to the dead lakes and we will hitch up but i can tell you what we can do we have plenty of room up there for people that want to move in and make that their home along with here in port st joe so this is a lot of details to it but this will be this is just beginning and it will uh, it will grow from there you know it's not as mr harrison stated Yes, it involves Coast Guard. But there'll be a never ending to repairs here. This will be a big, you'll see every kind of ship. Uh, yeah, you, what's the old saying? You can take a boat out of water, but it's hard to get a ship out. But anyway, it will be great here for this this community. It'll help the local merchants. It'll, ha it'll just help everyone, the realtors and all. But Harrison, I know you have worked diligently diligently on this along with Mr. Cernio and uh, I just want to tell you I appreciate it and I appreciate you choosing Guff County here so, letting us be a part of this and it, it will pay off it will pay off in the end I'll assure you good people I'll assure you Mr. Chairman I yield back yes sir any other commissioners uh, if I could Mr. Chairman yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Harrison thank you for the presentation I, I think it's a great day for, uh, yes, for Guff County nice. Other commissioner, thank you for your presentation and um, and going into great detail to explain uh, to the public just how important this is. Thank you again, sir. Yes, sir. Roger. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. We we are we truly looking forward to it. So we appreciate all your your hard work and time and uh, we we can't wait to see this vision come come to pass here in Gulf County. We, like I said, we've been waiting on it for a long time. So thank you for everything. Good. Thank uh, you for your yes. help, also to your staff. Uh, this has been a long time coming. I, some of you, I, I have worked uh, a number of years ago on uh, a project by the name of Suncoast Auto. Don probably remembers that. Uh, we've had a bunch of uh, shiny objects come through town uh, for a number of years. Now, I, I'm a resident of Panama City, you know, lived there my whole life. Um, but we've been working hard for a long time to get something that was, was really a, a sustainable uh, transformational opportunity and uh, hopefully we're going to get uh, full funding from from uh, tribe uh, we're, we're working uh, with the board on that uh, we've been determined eligible and they're supportive of that so we need to get full funding from them and uh, I can't imagine there's a there's a better project uh, east of Bay County than this one so uh, we'll continue to work on that with the legislature and and with you and if any of you have any questions you need any information please let us know uh, if any of you would like to come to uh, to see our operations at Allenton or Nelson, let us know. We'll be happy to to uh, to take you on those tours. Thank yes, you for your time. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I appreciate your help. You're welcome. At this time, we're gonna I'm gonna switch things around. I'm asking Miss Sarah Hines to come forward. She's gonna talk to us about heart health.
Good morning, ladies. Good morning. My name is Sarah Hines. I'm the Assistant Director for the Florida Department of Health in Gulf and Franklin Counties. I think everybody might know Ann Barnes. She's our school health coordinator. She's a registered nurse. And if you ask any student, she's probably the coolest nurse in Gulf <laughs> County. Um, but we're here to recognize Heart Health Month and talk about some heart healthy messages that we've been sharing with the public during the month of February. Because chances are, we all know someone affected by heart disease and stroke because heart disease is the leading cause of death for men and women in the United States. And while you can't change things like your age or your family history, the good news is that even modest changes to your diet and lifestyle can improve your heart health and lower your risk by as much as 80%. So the biggest part of living healthy is just making simple healthy choices. So in addition to seeing your doctor to manage health conditions, got a couple of tips and she's gonna share some medical advice. We want you to fuel your heart by eating a healthy diet. And the tip to that is to read the food labels, watch how much table salt you eat, watch how much sodium you have, and when you fill your plate every day, try to make half of it fruits and vegetables. We want you to move your heart by being physically active, aim for 150 minutes a week for adults, and many of us choose to walk, and I don't blame you because this is a beautiful county to walk around, um, but the tip is to do brisk walking, and that means you walk fast enough to get that heart pumping so that you'd be able, you're still able to talk, but you wouldn't be able to sing your favorite songs. And finally, we want you to love your heart by quitting tobacco. There are free resources out there locally. You just call the health department to get started. And so we ask you to share these messages, and remember that if you take care of your heart, your heart will take care of you. And so Anne's going to now share some symptoms associated with a heart attack that are really important to recognize. So go ahead, Anne. So I think probably everybody can hear me without the mic. Um, the biggest thing I'd like to say to everybody is we all see on television when someone has a heart attack. You know, they double up, they grab their chest, they grab their arm, everybody there goes, oh my gosh, it's a heart attack, and they all do what's supposed to be done. Well, typically that's not the way it works. Um, usually it's not something that happens suddenly, you know, the main event might be sudden, but it usually builds up. You know, usually looking back, people, originally they'll say, gosh, I had no idea I had any problems. But when you talk to them later, they'll say, you know, now that I think about it, I had been really tired. I noticed I, you know, I got really tired walking across the parking lot. I had to park closer because I got out of breath easier. Um, had to go to bed earlier because I just was tired, you know, fatigue. Um, one day I was sitting there and I just got really sick on my stomach. Started kind of sweating and I thought, well, you know, something I ate made me sick, had indigestion. And so I took some Tums. I'm like, well, did that help? No. Well, do you have indigestion a lot? No. I'm like, well, it probably wasn't indigestion. A lot of people end up going for a workup for cardiac and they'll get asked, well, did you have a heart attack? I'm like, no. And they said, well, it shows here that you do have some damage. And then, you know, when they think back, they're like, well, there was that one time when I really had that indigestion. And people don't want to go to the doctor. They don't want to bother. They don't want to look, they don't want to look foolish. You know, I, for one, have been, in, been checked out, and I felt like the biggest idiot because I said, I don't want to go in there, and then they tell me I'm a hysterical woman, you know. But listen, it's better to be called hysterical or mm -hmm. foolish or that you're bothering somebody than to sit home and have a massive heart attack because you think you have indigestion or you think you've caught a bug or whatever. Um, typical symptoms, chest pain, pain in the arm, um, you know, shortness of breath, all those. A lot of people don't have any of those. Some people just have the fatigue, the sweating. Some people hurt between their shoulders. Mm -hmm. women, women often have atypical pain. You might have jaw pain, toothache. When I was a, a young nurse 30-something years ago, I worked on cardiac floor, so I asked every patient that I saw, what were your symptoms, just because I was curious. Right. And what they told me was that um, nothing. I had a toothache and went to the dentist. And the dentist said, well, you don't have anything wrong with your tooth, but I want you to go to the cardiologist. And they had bypass surgery, like the next day. So, you know, women especially have to be on the, on the lookout for unusual symptoms. Anything different, you know, it's worth, it's worth its merit to get it checked, especially if you have a um, family history. Mm -hmm. If you have anybody in your family that before the age of 60 or especially before the age of 50 that had any kind of cardiac episode, you really need to get a baseline study done, you know. And that's the main thing. Another thing before we go that I wanted to mention, as I left the school, I asked our principal if there was anything that I could add today. And she said, oh, yeah, 
be sure and let them know that Port St. Joe Elementary School students from pre-K to sixth grade raised over $9,000 this year for the American Heart Association and their fundraiser, the Jump Rope for Hearts and Hoops for Hearts. And because of that, for their reward, they get to see their principal and a couple of other people kiss a pig on the last day of school. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, lady. Thank you, lady. Thank you, Ms. Barnes and Ms. Hines. I might can get the commissioners to uh, join in next year, and they might kiss a pig. <laughs> we raise, if we get more than nine thousand dollars. They do that on the north end, Sandy. Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on down. Number seven. Uh, Odina boat ramp conveyance, Deseret Ranches of North Florida. Novak, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the last few months, your continuing discussions, you've approved as we move forward some road abandonments um, at the end of 2017. Um, in the process of doing that, we also did a simultaneous, um, <coughs> accepted an offer by Deseret for their conveyance of Odina boat ramp to Gulf County, um, and they were generous enough to do that. Um, we've worked with our county engineers. We've outlined the access road and the uh, legal meets and bounds and footprint for that boat ramp. We're now at the final stages. Uh, Mr. Calvin Winder, Deseret uh, Council, is with us today. I appreciate him coming. We talked before this morning uh, before the meeting started um, on his way down. Um, we're at the point now where we need an authorizing vote of the commission um, to provide to the clerk's staff um, to note for the record that the county will accept Odina boat landing and ramp and access. Um, they're in the final stages of preparing that deed of conveyance. And once we receive that with your vote, we'll have the opportunity to go and record that. And that will become, uh, obviously, county recreational and park use in perpetuity. Um, they put some reverter language in there that if it's never used for that, um, but Deseret has uh, in the final steps of doing that. So I'd ask for an authorizing vote and answer any other questions you have with regards to that. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Novak. Motion, Mr. Chairman. I got a motion by Commissioner McCrone. Second. Second by uh, Commissioner Rogers. Any uh, further, further board discussion on? That's good, Mr. Chairman. I'd yes, like to thank uh, the board. Uh, we've been working on this for a while, and it's good to bring it, bring it home. So thank you all. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, with the county owning it, we leased it for I don't know how many years but now that we have uh, graciously from Deseret surrendered over to the county now we can go make improvements uh, really fix that up because down on this end of the county we don't have a lot of uh, where you get into the primarily fresh water brackish water but this this will be a great help Located down in District 5, the old Odina site. But this this will be a... Now then, we can go to work and uh, fix that up. Make it first class. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, any any other board discussion? Anyone in the public on Odina over ramp? Anyone? Um, any opposition to the motion? Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're, we'll move forward. Um, we'll get that deed uh, ideally recorded, and we'll make that public record um, and provide it to the clerk in the, in the next week or so. And again, I just want to thank Mr. Winder and uh, Mr. Michael Archibald. This is in addition to the Willis Landing last year that the county acquired. Um, and as I indicated before, Deseret's been a great partners with the county and, and working through these land issues as we move forward and, and providing these opportunities to the community. So I just wanted to thank them. Yes, sir. All right, number number eight, uh, we will hit you at courthouse, North Florida Child Development. That's me again, Chairman. Back to you, Mr. Novak. Uh, if I can, um, spoke with Ms. Sharon Gaskin. Um, since our last meeting, uh, we talked about the conveyance. You all authorized us to move forward. Since your last meeting, um, we proposed a land donation agreement as well as a deed of conveyance. There was three conditions of the conveyance, which were the reverter clause, if it was never used for North Florida Child Development, the preservation of jobs, in Weewahitchka for economic development. And then the third was that the county could continue to use that courthouse for the historic purposes that's been there for the 100 years. Um, since then, um, I've 
a few years ago, Patria Malden had reached out to the county and actually met with the administration and staff and had proposed a foundation to work with North Florida Child Development. In our discussions the last few weeks, Ms. Malden has reached out to myself, and I know she's reached out to some of you commissioners individually and spoken to you about adding a fourth condition to that conveyance, which was if North Florida Child Development were to get to a point where the foundation was structured and set up by Ms. Malden, there's a couple local families that have been obviously members of the Gulf County for all, pr pretty much over a century, um, and she's in the process of setting up that foundation. She's asked for us to include that in the donation agreement, and as well as the deed of conveyance, that if and when that foundation is established, that we can put that additional language in there to convey it out to them for historical purposes. It will give them access to more grants and preservation of the courthouse. Um, we'll put it in there in such a way that obviously it comes back and we'll notify the county if that ever were to happen. Um, but if there's any questions or objection to that additional fourth provision, I'd be happy to address it. Otherwise, we'll move forward in that direction with a vote of the board. Any questions for uh, Mr. Novak on this, this, is, this issue? I'm good. I'd be, uh, I'd be glad to place a motion on the floor, fourth edition. Out of way, it'll secure it, I'd say, forever for all of us in here. And, I'll second. Uh, this staff of people, they all have ties there. I have. My family was one that helped really develop this county from Calhoun and, and uh, I have a lot of a lot of ties to that building. Uh, it'll be preserved, and out of way, you, the taxpayers, won't, it won't take one penny of your money. At the Lorem taxes, these foundations, and we'll secure that building, and it'll be for historical use. It'll be for people that come down, visit, and go by there and look at it. And I'd be glad to uh, make the motion that we include that in this proposal mr chairman yes sir so i got a motion by commissioner mcdaniel and I second by commissioner uh, rich any further board discussion uh, anyone in the public you come on up to the podium mr. rich state your name and address once again please james rich 1490 transfer road we were hitchcock i think it's great too that y'all gonna do what you're doing that's a neat use of that old courthouse but there was a federal grant back in 2013 that was being worked on about having a room in the courthouse for a little museum. I wanted to That's ask you what came of that. It's in. It's all in part of this. It will be included. Yes, yes, yes. Outstanding. I just was afraid it got lost in the shuffle somehow. Oh, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Any, anyone else in the public on this issue? In opposition to the, uh, to the motion? Motion passes 5 and 0. All right, move on down to item number 10. So, Mr. Uh, County Roll Abandonments, Mr. Richard Stone here. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. If I may, um, and it just was a little jumbled up in terms of the, uh, w the, the, the topics, the County Road Abandonments, and if I can explain to the Commission how we, and then we're, we have public speakers that want to come up and speak okay. on it. Okay. Um, as I indicated before, with Deseret, we've had some abandonments of roads and right-of-ways over the last few months. A continuation of that is we had noticed and started the process through public advertisement and resolutions for Muskogee Road and Rish Harbor Road. Um, and they, there was a request to table it last month that you all voted to do so, um, to bring it back today. Um, we have it on the agenda today. Um, I know Ms. Commissioner McDaniel has been working on this issue. Um, as we indicated last month, we tabled it to bring it back with those two roads. I don't know if Commissioner McDaniel wanted to touch on it. Um, and then the folks that have submitted the public speaking forms okay. to come up under Rish Harbor and Muskegee Road for that particular issue that's been tabled to bring back. All right, so. Thank you, sir. I'm going to th throw it over to Commissioner McDaniel. You're going to address? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is a motion in order? Um, no motion on the floor. There, there is no motion at the time, Commissioner McDaniel, but certainly at any time, further direction to the staff um, or any discussion of the commission as to how to move forward. Okay. okay. The question is, are we in order for a motion? Would a motion be in order at this time? Yes, sir. Just yes, sir. Uh, All right. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this issue came up back and concerns, and we won't go into a lot of the details on all of it, but I've had an opportunity to end uh, I've spent quite a bit of time with Mr. Rich, who has probably more knowledge 
that area than anyone else in this room. But uh, after having long discussions and uh, uh, open-minded, uh, at this time, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to place a motion on the board, before the board, that we cease any further action on the closing of the Fresh Harbor Road and the Muskogee Road. That's my motion. I'll second that. Thank the, you. I got a motion to cease uh, by Commissioner McDaniel, second by Commissioner McCrone. Any further board discussion on this? If I could, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. McDaniel, I've got some inquiries I know you have, too, about the cemetery yes. up there. Uh, yes. Something we could do down the road on that. Uh, Two cemeteries. Right. So uh, that's all and I have. And there's the society uh, or the – anyway, they picked up on it, followed uh, with it, and hopefully it was restored of the people and the loved ones that I know Mr. Rich has family buried in one of those some anyway I'm good thank you uh, any any further board board discussion uh, anyone in the public on this come on back up Mr. Rich state your name once again for the record my name is James Rich I'm an agent but we were Hitchcock live on old transfer road um, just real quick you might wonder how a road got named Rich Harbor Road. At the end of that road on the south end is Rich's Pasture. In the spring when the high water comes, well, it's covered with water by and large. And uh, at one point, which, and, and who knows in the future if our potential evolves to put these old boats people don't want from the uh, boat yards I know of in Panama City, big boats that the engines are shot or whatever, they get the project gets abandoned. I ain't with the H.C. Take it, Rich. You can have it. I was going to have these out there in, the, in that pasture for people to have for fish camps or somewhere that's cheap to be that's right there, you know, or hunters, what have you. But when the high water comes, the boat still floats, so there it is floating. <laughs> down it goes, up and down. Therefore, when I was with the 9-11 guy about there being two Rich farm roads, one on Overstreet Road, Cousin Bobby's daughter's got that out there, that road was known as Rich Farm Road before this, but other than all that, we just named it Rich Harbor Road. We came to that agreement. That's how it came to be. And uh, in time, uh, that might evolve. Who knows? But that's the potential we have. And likewise, on the Muskogee Road, other landowners have potential with their property to do something with it because it's linked and nearby to a county road. If that gets thrown out in the window, our potential is greatly diminished our value of our property is diminished, and our hopes for doing something with our property is out the window. And we've been there a long time, and I don't see why that has to be that way. Uh, the people from Alabama who are mad about they had a medical emergency, they couldn't be here today. But uh, they're, they're really still upset about that cemetery being desecrated, and I don't blame them. Uh, over in Russia, in the old days, the communist Russia, they had a cemetery that, and they wanted to put a factory there, or an apartment house. They bulldozed it out of the way, a cemetery, and haul it to the dump and put a factory or apartment house there. That's the way they did it. But this isn't Soviet Russia, okay? And I would, uh, they, they're, they're going to be pushing for that to be a historical cemetery because of that Colonel Stone being married there. And I understand former Commissioner uh, Trailer was the fellow who had work crews clean up the remnant of the old cemetery. That's that's how that came to be. And I'd like y'all to look into that again, please, and, and work with Neil to get you know, and get that done. Uh, like I said, I don't think they maliciously did what they did. I think the subcontractors could care less, and they, they didn't know or didn't care, and they ran over that, and there's Mother Nature's taking it back. But that'd be a great thing for inmates to go clean up to teach leadership and responsibility <laughs> because it's really thick over it. But anyway, uh, long story short, as best I can make it. Uh, just leave it a county road, because if it gets to be a private road, access is going to be, it's already been difficult for some of you. Hold on one second, Mr. Rich. Get a, we'll get a motion extended. So move. Got a motion by Commissioner McCall. Second. Second by Commissioner Rogers in opposition. Motion passed 5 and up. Go ahead, Mr. Rich. Motion to do what? Continue to talk. Well, Stay your time. Yes, well, sir. I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, anyway, 
I, got, I try to help people what I can, and, that, and some people are staying on the trail behind my house that have nowhere to go. And this one fellow, he's back in the pogey again, but he has a drug problem. But he wrote me a letter, and he said at the end of it, I'm seeing a lot of wee wall guys coming here, so the sheriff's business must be booming in wee wall. <laughs> so, so thank you, Sheriff, for getting drug dealers off the streets. And uh, but if you can do that, you can get some of these people to turn up those roads if you would, please. Okay? You can put your sheriff deputies over on the rich property, surprise them, or camp out if you want to. We don't care. But if y'all just maintain that road as best you can once in a while, it's a lot better at being a private road and, and they just forget about it. At least we can come down here and petition y'all and bug you about cleaning the road up. They would have a deaf ear to us. And uh, and maybe get back involved in making that, working with the historical people to get that a historical cemetery. And the last thing I want to say is my grandfather's sister, who was buried there, her name is Mary Edna Rich. She was born in 1884 in either Iowa or Fort Gaines, Georgia. She died young, and she was buried in Iowa, Florida. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Rich. <clears throat> Anyone else in the, in the public on this issue? We got a motion by uh, Commissioner McDaniel, a uh, second by Commissioner McCrone. Uh, any opposition to the motion? Motion passes 5 and 0. Oh. All right, moving on down to uh, number 11. Limited maintenance agreement, Painted Pony Road. Snowback. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, um, I'll try to make it brief. Uh, the discussions come up historically on Painted Pony Road during uh, emergency uh, weather events. The county has gone out and done limited maintenance along that road. There's been actions of the board in the past to go out there and to provide some uh, grading to help uh, evacuation and emergency vehicles get there when low-lying areas and roads are impassable during these inclement weather. Um, what we've done is we've worked with the property owners um, over the last few months and uh, Commissioner McCrone to secure a limited maintenance agreement signed by all the adjacent property owners along this way to enable us to do it. And about six years ago, you adopted this policy where you have the limited maintenance agreement. You have to have the consent of the private landowners for the ability to get on there and do these uh, for public purposes. Um, I want to thank Chris Petrie. He's provided now 17 signed limited maintenance agreements from the neighborhood um, and working with Commissioner McCrone. And I provide them to you all for your consideration um, to accept them, authorize the administrator to sign this, and then giving the public works the ability to go forward in the future and, and do the limited maintenance on this road during these uh, weather events. We need a motion to move forward with the limited maintenance. Yes, yeah. sir, and I'll be happy to answer any questions, commissioners, um, with regards to it. So moved, Mr. Chairman. All right, I got a motion by Commissioner McCrone. Second. Second by Commissioner Rogers. Any further board discussion? Any questions for the attorney? Anyone in the public on this limited maintenance agreement? And come on, come on up, Dr. Pat. Uh, Pat, Pat Hardman, uh, President of Coastal Community Association. I, I didn't do my homework on this one. I, I dropped the ball, okay? Um, historically, this road has been kept up for the evacuation. Indian Pass people do not have a way to get out if it's not through here. But I just want to make sure that we went beyond Painted and Pony. Do that if that's all you got today. But Painted and Pony gets you to the wood, through the woods. You then got to get canoe lane and barefoot to get to the highway. So we have, Lee and Mark and I talked about this in the past. I don't know if that was included in this, but if not, we need to. You can't, you can't get out unless you go ahead and go those two areas as well. And I promise you there'll be no opposition, but you, we just need to add those two to the list to get them out the woods. Uh, Mark and I leave, and I've got some more research for you since then. We got surveys. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Just don't stop there. Right. <laughs> I want to get them not out, just yeah. out the woods, but off the road. Okay. All right, Doc. Thank, you. Thank you. Any anyone else in the public on this issue? So we got a motion by uh, Commissioner McCrone, second by Commissioner Rogers. Any opposition to the motion? Motion passes five and zero. All right, moving on down to number 12, 
uh, Dwayne Pigiovanni, Animal Control. Uh, Mr. Leon, he's representing the business, so give him five. So Dwayne Pierre Giovanni, 7583 Cape San Blas Road, Port St. Joe, Florida. So I'm here to discuss. And I would accept. Okay. There you go. Dwayne, when you you represent your your business, right? Well, me and I'm from. I mean, I own Coneheads 8020. If we if that makes a difference. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to straighten this mess up. One of these <laughs> Can you hear me now? Is it loud enough? No. Where did I get hand him that? He can turn face one. It probably battery dead, isn't it? It may be the people in the hall that can't hear you. Check, check. Mr. Chairman. Check. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. The microphone's working. If we can ask Mr. Pierre Jeremy just to project. And that's the system's picking it up, I think, for Miss Lana's recording purposes. So if you could just ask him to speak up. Just speak loud. Is this speak loud? loud. Is yes, this loud enough? Yeah, just speak loud. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Okay. <laughs> so I'm here to discuss um, Cape Sand Blast, as it says here, and dealing with animal control enforcement uh, because of certain issues. Uh, Cape Sand Blast is becoming soiled and unleashed. So I'm going to go through this brief presentation here. Now, Cape San Blas is very much recognized as a world-class beach. It has been recognized as the number one beach in 2002 and 2014, having the number one state park in the country. Uh, very respectable magazines, such as Coastal Living Magazine, has consistently ranked it as in the top beaches in Florida and in the United States. And just dealing with growth, with the state park alone, talking with uh, the agency there, in 2014 and in 2013, nearly 400,000 people came to that park in each year. So Cape San Blas is an amazing asset to the county, an amazing beach. And the world recognizes this. So let's get into some of the laws that we have in Gulf County that are designed to protect this incredible, beautiful asset. Animal control. Now, Gulf County advertises itself as a pet-friendly destination. And because of that, there are certain ordinances that have been implemented to make sure the Cape is protected. The one that we're going to discuss is the animal control ordinance here and particularly understanding definitions of restraint and public nuisance or nuisance animal with respect to the animal control ordinance. Now if you go to the next slide here, it gives the definition of restraint according to the ordinance. It's an animal that is confined within the real property limits of its owner or secured by a leash or lead. Pretty simple definition. Now, it goes without saying, there are some individuals who respect the laws that have been implemented here when they walk their dog or dogs on the beach. However, the number of individuals who do not respect this law is growing significantly. There are many photos of unleashed dogs all over social media, all over, for example, YouTube. There are videos of people having dogs running all over the beach, unleashed, playing with their families while there are people around them who have no association with these dogs. Because of this, there are many, many complaints about unleashed dogs on the beach. These complaints range from these dogs simply approaching them, coming under their tent, 
uh, talking about jumping on them, attempting to bite them or their dogs, etc. So just how common is it for people to complain about unleashed dogs on the beach? Well, let's just look at a very fraction of the complaints that people talk about unleashed dogs. These were written by people very recently. And what's interesting, when you look at these comments here, these are by individuals who love walking their dog on the beach. They love that feature. However, they do not like the fact that there are people who do not respect that law and they let their dogs run all over the beach. Many of these individuals here, for example, my leash dog has been attacked twice on the beach by untethered dogs. Another individual says her small dog was attacked by a dog four times larger than hers. So people who are respecting the leash law are now being disrespected by individuals who do not want to obey the leash law. Well, what other features does animal control entail? Well, it entails waste. The definition of public nuisance or nuisance animal is an animal shall be considered a nuisance if it damages, soils, defiles, or defecated on private property other than, want, than the owners or on a public works recreation areas unless waste is immediately removed and properly disposed of by the owner molest, attacks, or interfere with persons or other domestic animals on public property. Now these are pictures that I took as I was walking down to the beach. This violates the animal control ordinance and unimaginably takes away from the cape and its splendor. It's interesting that if you do a little research on this, it'll tell you, for example, oh, sorry. Hold on one second, Mr. Bridge run. You get a motion in the one to extend time. Motion to extend. I'll give the motion. Go ahead. All right. Got a motion by uh, Commissioner McCrone. Second. Second by Commissioner Rich. Okay. Give me more time, Miss Miss Leona. Yes, so go I can ahead. go. Yes. Okay. So. Different organizations, for example, em explain, well, we're not there yet, okay. <laughs> uh, explain how pet waste is damaging to the beach, and in particular, the people on the beach. For example, one website called LeaveNoTrace.org says that pest waste smells can be a health hazard for people, particularly children and other animals, and it is not natural to any environment. Cleaning up after your pet helps protect water resources, plant life, and habitat for native animals. It's interesting, in Franklin County, they have signs there, and it talks about the leash law, and it says that dog waste is a threat to the health of our children, degrades our county, and transmits disease. So then, this would be a problem. But why is this continuing? Perhaps people not picking up after their dogs and then feeling very free to just let their dogs roam on the beach while others respect the leash law. Well, part of this problem, this is the next slide, is twofold. Lack of enforcement. That's okay. Lack of enforcement. And then the marketing and advertising they exclude. Now, the enforcement may be an issue because of funding. Funding is always an issue. It, it's the bedrock of almost any issue of any county, any city, any agency. And so at the end, we're going to kind of go over some ways that perhaps we can fix that. But then let's look at the marketing. As we said, under the Animal Control Ordinance, restraint is defined by an animal being on a leash or lead. However, sometimes photos are posted where the animal is not on a leash or lead by agencies that are promoting the county. But then there are other local businesses who are very good at many things that they do, but if you look at their Facebook, their so other social media, their websites, they have many pictures of unleashed dogs on their sites. So when someone does research, this is what they see, which is makes them think that this is what Gulf County is about 
unleash dogs on the beach. It's interesting, on one of the, when I saw this picture in one of the comments on the TDC Facebook page, a lady back in January said, is there a leash law in your county? Because if I research YouTube, all I see is unleashed dogs. Is your leash law even enforced? That's the image that is projected. So let's look at some solutions, possible solutions. So what I did was looked at other coastal counties to see the things that they do. For example, enforcement with the funding. We can't necessarily just, money doesn't just grow off trees. So perhaps it's possible to use some of the bed tax to fund code enforcement. Perhaps that can be allocated in some way. Some counties charge individuals a fee to purchase a dog tag. And then that fee obviously allows that family to take their dog to the beach. But then the money goes straight back into the county and it's used to pay for people to have enforcement. That perhaps may be an option to get enforcement. Other counties, because funding is such an issue with enforcement, designate certain areas of the beach that are pet friendly. Some counties set time limits on which dogs can be on the beach. And then there are other options that the commission might want to look at that will be better for this area. But there are many ways in which we can handle this issue of lack of animal control. And then finally, I want to address uh, behavioral issues with this. Obviously, this presentation is about controlling unleashed dogs on the beach, finding a way to protect the asset while allowing people to have their dogs on the beach. <coughs> However, some have misrepresented this presentation, which has caused quite the stir on social media. But to give you how some of these individuals think, for example, there were two dogs that were recently killed on Cape San Blas. Unfortunately, they were in the middle of the road. And many individuals, instead of recognizing that perhaps animal control laws were violated, quickly attacked the individual who hit the dogs. Now, obviously, there are many factors that could be presented about this. But at the end, it appears that the individual was not at fault and that the animal control laws perhaps were not being respected. And then with respect to this, it's interesting because of the misrepresentation of this presentation, which has been good because it gave it a lot of publicity, which is nice, a lot of people are present. There have been very interesting comments made with respect to our particular business which we don't think will have a necessary bearing, but the fact that they would be willing to even attempt to hurt our business because of a dog being on the beach perhaps shows the mentality of a few individuals who do not have a balanced view of this. So at the end, that's the end of the presentation. So the point of this is hopefully to implement some measures, ideally, with enforcement that will help and finish, reduce please. this uh, issue of unleashed dogs on the beach. Sir, thank you, Mr. Pidgevani. Any, uh, hold on, Mr. Pidgevani. I think some board members might have a, just want to ask a couple questions. Uh, uh, one thing we need to, like, like Mr. Pidgevani said, uh, I, it did get misrepresented. Some, somehow it got out there like he was a, uh, wanted to ban the dogs on the beach. That, that was incorrect. He was just dealing with the, the leash law. So let's make sure we know where, where we're going. You want to say something, Commissioner? Powell? Absolutely. Uh, Dwayne, we do have a leash law. We're a small county, but I think overall the majority of the people abide by the law. Uh, I, I just don't see that bigger. I, we're never going to get 100% uh, <laughs> compliance. Okay. Thank you. And, and to insinuate that we're projecting that we don't have a leash law, I, I think it's just, just dead wrong. Uh, oh, okay. you, you projected the TDC, you know, is promoting that. I don't see that. I get calls my first year on this board, and, and the administration can testify to this. I've had calls we've had to send animal control numerous times. Down to that end, we've got one animal control guy. Mm -hmm. You're always going to have a percentage of people that's not going to abide by the law. There's nothing we 
we're never going to get 100% enforcement. But I think overall the majority of the people do the right thing. It, but but it, there's always going to be some issues. Can That's I? All I got. Yes, Am I yeah. allowed to say anything or no? Is that? I don't want to say any other board members. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, may I? Thank you, Mr. Giovanni. As Commissioner Crone stated, let me just add to this: ninety-eight percent of the time we have good parents. You have 2% bad parents. 98% of the people that drive on the highway are a good driver, and you have 2% out there as bad drivers. That's just the way life is. I'm a big animal lover. I talk with Mr. Trailer, who works with the T he works with the TDC, and he's out there on that beach probably more than other than the ones that live directly there. And I asked him just yesterday, I said, uh, I want to know. He said, Mr. McDaniel, Commissioner McDaniel, we've had a little problems out there. He said, I'm on that beach. He said, everybody's good. He says, most of them, they're well-mannered. The animals that are out there are well-mannered. And uh, he said, I've, I've really had, I don't have any issues with it. Uh, so that's what I wanted to hear. So uh, said again, probably, Commissioner said, probably 98% are good. You're always going to have that 2% anywhere you go, so. That's all I have to say about it. I'm in 100% support of the people with their animals uh, on the beach. I had a rash of emails come to me. I counted them up. I had 28. 26 were positive. Two were negative. So I'm behind the support the animal lovers out there 100%. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Any, anybody, any other commissioner? Any other commissioner? I, Commissioner I, Rich? I just want to thank you and appreciate your time and presentation and, and uh, getting everybody to come out and and um, just nobody wants to step in it, so just make sure you pick up after you. <laughs> Love one. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Rogers, you got anything? Uh, Dwayne, like I said, thank you for your pres uh, your presentation. Uh, and like I said, it's, it's probably some people not going to follow the law regardless. Right. I mean, that, I mean that's, that's in everything. That's in the speed. That's in everything. So uh, hopefully... Uh, uh, like I said, we can uh, we can reach out to those that those two percent or five percent, or whatever it might be, who are not following the law. We can get those get those to uh, agree. Like I say, uh, uh, majority of people do are doing what's right, but sometimes it are those that are gonna push it to the limit. They're gonna do what they feel. They feel I paid my money, so I'm gonna do what I want to do out here. So I mean, we, we'll just have to deal with those when they come. But thank you for your presentation. All right, uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed yes, it. Hope you got something else. I just won't take up with the TDC on one thing with that with that picture, and I got a lot of pictures from you. And I, I I'm an animal lover. I, I do think people need to keep their dogs to themselves. There's nothing wrong with that picture in the in the TDC. We'll have to disagree about that. That that woman's taking a picture with the dog. She's she's contained. She's not running around and doing anything. And we, you know we have to use common sense. I mean, dogs not going to be a le on a leash 24/7. But if they're right there with their owner and they're not bothering anybody, they're following the law in my book. And I just I just want to say that for the for the TDC. <laughs> All right, come on, Miss Miss Godwin, come on. Oh. Excuse me. Thank you, Commissioners. I just wanted to make a couple of statements while we're on this topic, um, and especially in regards to the photo. The dog actually is leashed. It's just hidden for the picture. And if you read the post, it's introducing our visitors to our staff as concierge members and asking for them to ask us questions, how we can help plan their trip. So that's the perfect opportunity for us to say, yes, please bring your dog, but make sure that they're leased and, leashed and picked up after. Um, people traveling with pets are a huge part of our market. Um, it's our top performing um, and largest campaign, and it is the second most visited page on our website. Um, I would say that our accommodations are roughly 60 to 70 percent pet friendly. Um, the TDC message always educates um, people about our leash law. The visitor input that we've gotten over the last few days with this topic surfacing um, has been overwhelming that if changes um, or restrictions were put that they will not be returning. So I think that bed tax collections would definitely um, suffer if, if there were to be changes made. Um, we rarely get complaints. The Welcome Center is pet friendly. The owners that come in with their pets are very responsible pet owners. They treat them like their family. Um, and 
and then one other thing is that we were voted 2015 best city for pet travelers so that this is a very important topic and I appreciate you listening yes ma'am thank you and again the presentation was for enforcement not for banning the beach um, mm -hmm. I disagree with Tim but the websites the things of that nature even the photo on there it doesn't appear to be on a leash so it can be somewhat confusing okay. but thank you for your time yes sir thank you All right, this time, Ms. Diana Burkett, Animal Control Ordinance. Uh, Diana Burkett, 1910 Juniper Avenue. I'm representing St. Joseph Bay Humane Society. Well. What's Ms. Leanna, too? Thank you, Diane. Uh, gotta break you there. Uh, I just want to go over something. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Can everybody hear me? There you go. Okay, I just want to go over something that we've been working with for several months about. Um, proper sheltering and tethering of animals in Guff County. Uh, but between Ronald being out as well as sheriff deputies and police officers, we see a lot of animals that are staked, tied to trees, other things that happen uh, with animals. And it causes a large amount of animals to be brought into our shelter. So uh, Ronald and the staff at the shelter and board members have done some research with other local counties and agencies on how to prevent animal cruelty. So we have put together this uh, information. I'm, Lynn's not here, but Lynn Lanier helped me work on this. And I want to thank Mr. McDaniel. I want to thank Don Butler and Mr. Novak for working with me on this. and. Uh, as well as Chief Harry and, uh, and uh, Sheriff Harrison, whose officers and deputies have done a great job trying to help us control this problem. Um, I'd like to just present before the board that we look at these ordinances, review them, and I'd like to do whatever we need to do to get them passed and put into Gulf County and put them into effect. Um, we've got to do something. Um, there's there's some cruelty in this county there's people and if you want to have a pet I think there's a way to take care of it and I think there's a proper way to do it and we're asking for proper sheltering food and water and also uh, and I'm not talking about a piece of plywood against a pine tree I'm talking about proper sheltering and I'm talking about proper and tethering and and we would would like to put in a probation period We'd like to put this in the paper. We'd like to put flyers out. If all this is passed and presented, we'd like to do all of this, uh, hopefully, to control some of the problem. And if you go to these areas where some of these animals are being treated like this, I'm sure Sheriff Harrison can tell you it leads to a lot of other things that are problems, like drugs and dog fighting and everything else. So as a animal lover, uh, I would like very much, and I think uh, Board of Directors of the Humane Society and the staff would uh, ask your help to get this enforced for us so we can try to do something to clean some of this up in the county. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Diana. Any questions for Burkett? Any? Mr. Chairman, if I Question. can, I'm going to give to Diana. Um, the language that she's provided you, the summary, um, that is an ordinance form, and there's a copy there that she's been working with staff on. As you commissioners know, the ordinance process, when you amend a local law, it starts with you. Um, so the county doesn't get out in front of the commission. If you uh, authorize it and direct the staff to do so, then we start the noticing process. We have public hearings. Diane and her team and the commission all get feedback, and then you ha in the future we notice this language. Um, if, if Diana wants to provide one to Leanna, and then to the commissioners, that's all a copy right there, Diane, I just hand it to you. Yeah. Um, the proposed language in there is what the, they're proposing as an amendment. 
um, and we'll start the process if you authorize us to do so. But we don't get out and notice a hearing without your authorization. And mm -hmm. she has a copy. Yes, yes, ma'am. That's your language. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So Ms. Diane's giving you the uh, language that they're proposing, um, and if you authorize, we'll notice that proposed amendment. It won't be decided on today, but it'll be noticed for future months' meetings when they'll be considered by you and the public. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir. Is that good? Yes, ma'am. That's good. Thank you, Ms. Burkett. So I'm assuming that we need an, uh, we're going to need a motion to notice a hearing for this if we move, <coughs> move forward. If the commission wishes to move forward and notice a public hearing for these proposed amendments to change the tethering language for Gulf County, and you'll see most notably on page one that I provided to you the definition of an animal shelter. And then there's a provision added, Section 5, which really defines and lays out tethering. And I can just detail it for you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, uh, and I'll hit the high points. Animals which are tethered must be in such a manner as to prevent injury or strangulation or entanglement. No animal under six months of age, sick or injured, may be tethered. No animal will be, shall be tethered during severe or extreme weather. No animal shall be confined to a vacant or abandoned structure. Every animal must be tethered separately at a distance that the animals cannot tangle their tether with another animal. If a tether is used, it must be at least 10 feet long, free from entanglement. Uh, logging chains and vehicle chains are prohibited. No person shall add any weight to any McConnell collar, harness, chain, or tether. Collars may be used to attach an animal, should be comfortable and properly fitted as to not choke the animal. The animals may be attached to a running line, pulley, or trolley system, provided a choke chain and pinch collar is not used. Overhead pulley running line shall be at least 15 foot in length and no less than 7 feet above the ground. Any animal on a pulley or line shall have access to food, shelter, and water without danger of entanglement and strangulation. Um, and then it provides for an enforcement and penalty phase. Um, these are all up for discussion, and these are the recommendations. There's some other um, non-substantial changes, but with regards to nuances of language throughout it. But those are the high points of the proposed changes, sir. Thanks, sir. So for board discussion. Board members on this uh, ordinance change. Mr. McDay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to place a motion on the floor that we table this. I'm going to look over this okay. and get out and do it. Just talk to some of the people and see what we really got. And this goes right back to that old saying 98% are good and that 2% are bad. But I, I don't think we need to. Basically, till we look this, I want an opportunity to look over okay. and go over. So I'll put a motion on there. We got a motion by Commissioner McDaniel to table this. Uh, any second? Second. Second by Commissioner Rogers. Any further board discussion? Anyone in the public on this issue? Yes, ma'am. Come on up to the uh, the podium. State your name and your address for the record, please. It's Janet Warren, 7583 Cape San Blas Road. Janet Warren. Yes. Thank you. And it's about number 12. Hold on, Ms. Lowe. And the presentation. Okay. And we already passed that one. Well, you didn't call for comment after the presentation with Dwayne. Go ahead, Ms. Bridgewater. Okay. Ms. Warren. I live on the Cape. I've lived there for over 30 years. And um, I can say that the problem is a little more prevalent than I think the average person thinks. I see on a daily basis people in violation of the leash law or cleaning up. And it is becoming an increasing problem because I've lived out there for so long, so I have seen it grow. This is not about the responsible dog owners. And it's not about dogs in general, it's about people that are being irresponsible and inconsiderate of others. And so that's all it's really about. We think we have a beautiful beach, we think it's very tranquil, and we think that the prevalence of inconsiderate dog owners can threaten both the beauty and the tranquility for everybody because it leads to confrontation, it leads to so many unnecessary things. So. This isn't about the responsible dog owners. It's about the people who aren't concerned with their neighbor and the tranquility that we're trying to preserve. And we're not trying to change. We're trying to go back to a time when it was a little more peaceful 
and less confrontation. And we think that can be accomplished if people are more respectful of the ordinances that are already in place. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Thank you. Anyone else in the, in the public? No. I will take this side first right here. Come on up, sir. State your name and state your name. Now we're talking about the, I hope we're talking about the ordinance, the table of the ordinance. Well, I'm, we, I didn't get an opportunity okay. either. Okay. My name is Walter Enders. Here's your address, 160 please. Florida Avenue on the Cape. I would just like to know, since these people asked for five minutes because they represent a business interest, what those business interests are. Uh, other people have stated who they represent. I would just like to know who you represent. You, you want them to I tell. want the I want the presenters to state who they're representing, given that they asked for a five-minute presentation, which necessitates that they represent someone other than themselves as an individual. Okay. All right. Chairman, yeah, may I address that? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, at the end, you know, we have the public comment. But if you get on the agenda, which uh, Dave was on the agenda, we, we allow you five minutes, or if you represent a group, as a lot of times, uh, and Dr. Hardman here, she comes up, she represents herself, it's three minutes, she represents the coastal community, she gets five minutes. But uh, Dwayne was on there, Miss Diane's on there, so that's the reason the three and the five. You get on the agenda. Thank you. Okay. Well, we had another hand. Come on up. Good morning, my name is Kim Miller. I'm a property owner here in Gulf County, and I'm also a licensed community association manager in the state of Florida. I manage five St. Joe communities. Um, I'm also on the board of directors for the St. Joe Bay Humane Society. So on behalf as a board member, I'd like to thank you for your consideration for our two-legged friends as well as our four-legged friends today on um, both issues that have been addressed. Um, I was aware of, of uh, us being on the 2015 Best City for Pet Travelers. Um, this is a nationally um, known website, and it brings a lot of credibility to our county. It gives us a lot of um, notoriety, and it even references on their website for visitors to go to visitgulfcounty.com. And so um, we do get a lot of um, visibility for that. But I just want to say that um, I'm also, my husband and I are also a business owner here in Gulf County as well. And we have a lot of people that come through our business that are pet owners. And we are a pet owner as well. And we do follow the rules. And I respect Mr. Pierre Giuliani for his addressing the board. Um, it sounds like everybody's pretty much in agreement that we're not asking for pets not to be allowed on our beaches. We're just asking for a little bit better enforcement. One thing that made this program so successful through some of the St. Joe communities was the fact that we did have dogs clean up stations at various points. And I will point out that on having um, waste on the beach, there are other animals that are also on our beaches, raccoons, deer, bear, coyotes. And so unless it's sent off to the lab, I don't know how to determine which feces is which in some cases. But um, I would just say that uh, maybe the answer would be a few more cleanup stations and just better enforcement. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. Right. Any, anybody else in the public on this issue? All right, so we got a motion to table by Commissioner McDaniel. Got a second by uh, Commissioner Rogers. Uh, any opposition to the motion? Motion, motion passes 5-0. All right. At this time, we're going to take a short recess, five-minute recess. <laughs>